Hello. Welcome to Stories in Time. In focus today. In focus with a storyteller guest uh, from Montgomery County, Maryland, Jane Dorfman. Hi, Jane. Hey, hi. Nice, hi. So nice to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. You've been here before. I've been here before, but I'm happy to come back. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, we're very happy to have you back. Jane, you're a librarian as well mm -hmm. as a storyteller. Right. And do you add anything else to that? I do a little writing, mostly unpublished, but, you know, I add that in sometimes, too. Oh, good. I good. do a little storytelling organizing, which is a, a big job this time of year. So. Well, it is, and that just leads us into a question that I had wanted to ask you. A very big event that you organize every year just occurred here, mm -hmm. and uh, you've been doing that for quite a while. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, that's the Washington Folk Festival. I organize a little piece of it. I do the storytelling stage. I'm on the performing committee. For, um, I do a little bit of help with the music things, but mostly the storytelling. I engage the tellers, and I juggle people's times, and it's been really a, a rewarding thing to do. And this year's was just wonderful. How long have you been doing that? About 10 years. It's hard to imagine wow. it's that long, but wow. it's a while. Yeah. Well, that gives you an opportunity to really know, well, you have to know before you start doing it, but you really know the tellers in the area pretty well, too, yeah. and how they'll go together, how they'll fit on the schedule. I know how they'll go together. More often it's like, oh, I can't do before 1.30, and, and I have to be out before. So it's more their choice of what story follows what. Right, right. But I do see some of them, you know, move along and grow, especially the younger ones, you know. That's, oh, that's and really you know, nice. we have uh, in the Voices in the Glen, uh, of which you're president mm -hmm. in this area, uh, storytellers from the greater metropolitan area. Right. You know, we have young tellers, don't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, Zoe Sagalo. Zoe Sagalo and Jake Simpson. Both of them started out in the Twin Brook Tellers, the kids group, mm -hmm. and now they have graduated on up to uh, having a slot of their own. And Fabulous. it's really neat. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Zoe published uh, on Facebook this weekend mm -hmm. that this weekend was her high school graduation. Yes, she graduated, and uh, that was, it was just very exciting to see. Yeah, she's uh, going as an early admission to the University of Maryland, and she talked a little bit about that. She wove that into the story she was telling a little bit. So oh, good, very, good. Very graceful teller. It is, and so now Twinbrook Tellers is mm -hmm. a group that grooms tellers or teaches. It teaches, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Eve Burton runs that. It started out in the libraries, and now it's part of a 4-H club. But mm -hmm. uh, they brought up some wonderful young tellers, and even some kids who are not ready to be on stage, but they're just learning to storytell and, and learn to love stories. And Great. That's a big plus for me. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now, the thing that I noticed this year, um, I kept hearing so much more uh, publicity mm -hmm. about the Washington Folk Festival than I ever had before in right. all these years. How did that come about? Well, Do you have any idea? We got some uh, new people on the program committee. They made contact with TV stations and radio and finally got the Washington Post to print some stuff. And that, yeah, we had a lot more publicity. They went out to Glen Echo and the uh, head of the Whole Folk Festival and the news reporter rode the carousel together. It was very cute. Well, <laughs> did you see a difference in the attendance from when you've seen it in the past? I think we had a really good attendance. Um, that was helped by the perfect weather. So it's yeah. kind of hard to tell what was news and what was, uh, what was the weather. But well, yeah, we had, a, we had a good attendance this yeah. year. What generally, just give us sort of a snapshot of what the stories were, what kind of stories what were kind the of stories? Um, we had a few personal stories. We had some, a lot of folk tales, um, some very funny ones. Uh, and we had some, um, I did a set where I actually got the kids on the stage to help me tell the story. Oh, cool. Which was a lot of fun, yeah. I, I just lucked out and picked really perfect children who were happy to get up there and ham it up a little bit, you know. Oh, good. So that was neat. Uh, we had some people who did a little singing in their stories, and it was a really nice mix, you know. Good, it was good. It was a good Well, a people tell. should, you should know that, that if you're thinking next year it'll happen in June, and you want to come to the Washington Folk Festival out at Glen Echo, then Jane's just given you a snapshot <laughs> of what you can of probably the story expect. Telling, yeah. Yeah. Along with, you know, music all day of any kind you can think of, and dance, and crafts. It was, uh, it's a nice festival, it really is. Yeah. Now, thinking about, you told me when we were chatting that you're going to be doing something else at the end of the month. 
that has to do uh, predominantly with storytelling? Storytelling, yeah. The, um, the National Storytelling Association um, has a conference every year, which I've never been to before. I've been to the festival where you hear the big name tellers tell. But I've never been to the conference, which is more to practice storytelling and learn more about the business. So I'm excited. That's in Cincinnati, and uh, be traveling up it there. It should be fabulous. And but and you've never been. I've never been. So I can put you know faces to all these names that I know from online and from emails. Right. So right. It'll, be, it'll be good to see. Right. Yeah. I know that uh, I've only been once. I went to Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and it was so exciting. Exactly what you're talking about to be in the room with tellers from all over the country, mm -hmm. and who are. Um, well, it was the friendliest group I've ever been yeah. in. I, <laughs> I think bet it will be. that you are going to find that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is there anything particular that you're looking forward to at this conference? Do you have anything um, in mind? I think the swaps, they have swaps, you know, for tellers to sign up for. I think that'll be fun. And there's some business things which I don't do well enough in my own storytelling that I think, you know, a little bit more in promotion and websites and things like that that uh, I can learn something from it. Actually, now talk a little bit about what you think you're going to find in that promotion um, workshop. I think I'm going to find something that will talk me through the steps, that will tell me, the, okay, this is, the, this is the technology and the social media that you need. This would be secondary. And give me the basics and give me what st other storytellers have found productive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think that will be useful. I, th I think it will be useful. I think one of the things that you just touched on with uh, the, Na the Folklore Festival is that how important it is to talk beyond storytellers, mm -hmm. you know, to the general public. And that that's, that's really, you have to get somebody that, that understands how to get out into the bigger, bigger media, right? you know, because we do a lot of talking with each other. Mm -hmm. Which is good. Yes, and important. occasionally we have events where we're all just listening to each other and there's <laughs> yeah. nobody else. That's right. And that's nice, but it's not ideal. You know, you, you want know, some. You have to get the people. word out right. into the right. bigger right. world. And that is really um, sort of like, what was it I was thinking about not long ago when you have a big issue like that? Isn't there a story about uh, eating the elephant one bite at a time? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's sort of like promotion is sort of like doing yeah, that, where yeah. you eat that elephant one bite at a time. Yes. You yeah. know. And sometimes, you know, you feel like you've done so much and everybody must be sick of hearing about it by now and you pull into the, um, it's down at Glen Echo Park and you pull into the parking lot and there are some people there for the puppet show and they say, what's going on today? And you go, how can you not know already? But right, <coughs> right, you haven't right. gotten the word out. They, right. Everybody has not heard what's happening. It, that is astounding, isn't yes. it? You know, astounding. There's another event. I don't know if you're planning on going. I haven't looked at it too closely. Um, the Smithsonian is having their Folk Life Festival in the part of mm -hmm. Ju July, and <coughs> they're bringing in um, tellers and this sort of thing. But they're bringing in, have you heard about the fact they're bringing back the AIDS quilt? Oh, no, I haven't. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. My daughter and I went down when it was here last time and helped fold the quilt. Afterwards. Did you really tell yeah. us about that? Uh, that was just, we just happened to be at the Smithsonian and the quilt was there and it was really, you know, it's very touching to see it. Yeah. Uh, and then at the end they have this very organized procedure where every, every square is reverently folded up and put back in its storage bag. And so we said, let's go do it, let's go help. And I think she was young at that time and I think she really remembers doing that. Well, you know, because for any of you who've not seen it, the quilt becomes whole when it's spread out all over the acreage of the mall. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, se the quilts are separated by uh, runners where you can walk through it. Mm -hmm. And each small quilt is the story of a victim of AIDS. And they're it's not that, they're six feet. They're longer. Yeah, they're big. Know. Uh, I saw a woman talking about this just recently, and she said it's grown. Mm -hmm. You know, they're bringing it back because of the fact that um, there's not been a cure. People are will mm -hmm. still losing people to that. But I had no idea that you had actually gone down and helped yeah. take it up. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was, I don't know how to describe it. It was a special feeling doing that. Oh, know? I can imagine. And we, did, we weren't folding Rock Hudson or anybody famous. We were just folding you know, a couple of ordinary people whose families had 
made these quilts for them yeah because yeah. i remember i went to when they had mm -hmm. it stretched out before and um my husband and i walked through it and it was just the most amazing and moving experience yeah for it them. really is a, a, an individual stories on some of those quilts i mean some are kind of primitive some are exquisite you know but um ev every one of them you know, hides a story behind it that we don't know, but yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what we're saying in that is uh, it's more and more out in the media and whatever that we were talking first about the presentation of story, mm -hmm. say at the folk festival, or you know, learning about story at the conference, but that storytelling or telling of one's story has just become so commonplace in advertising and what that they're using. Mm -hmm. You know, that so tell your story, you know, tell it with story. But it seems to me that what you're describing, the AIDS quilt, is really pure story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and an act of love, too, that somebody, you know, not always a family member even. Sometimes it was, you know, friends um, mm -hmm. who made those for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do that just around the dining room table or the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. You know, did you grow up in a family that told stories? Yeah, I grew up in a family that uh, sort of a um, little bit competitive storytelling, especially my mother and my great aunt would argue about who had the correct version of the story. <laughs> right. And that right. was interesting. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of storytelling. You know, I know what I know about, um, you know, my family two or three generations back is from hearing stories. And I wish I had heard more and I wish yes. I had noted down more. Yes, yes, but, yes. But, um, you know, I do know, I do know some. And, and now when I ask my mother trying to clarify some details, she doesn't remember them. And that's sad, you know. What does she truly not remember or she just doesn't want to share them? I think she would, would share them if she, if she remembered them. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. remembers things from her childhood, um, which I have even written, I've written some of those down happily. Um, but she, uh, some of the other ones that I remember from my great aunt and my grandmother, no, she oh, doesn't remember shame. them. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah. You know, that, um, I hope that people realize how important, just as you're saying, you know, that those stories are going to be uh, mm -hmm. the rest of your life and that they're so important for our children. Right. You know, th and uh, make an effort. Not everything's online. No, we're abandoning our children. Voice to voice. Children. Yeah, know? we're yeah. abandoning our children to yeah. TV and yeah. online storytelling rather than telling it to them ourselves. Right. Yeah. And I think people should tell these folk tales, too, because everybody knows some of these stories. And they're surprised, I think, when they think, oh, yeah, I know that story, you know. Right. I've read it. I've heard it. Somebody told it to me. Um, and I noticed at the folk festival, when I, when I was getting the little kids up on the stage, and uh, this one would be the donkey, this one was the Bremontown musicians, this one would be the dog, the cat. There were just as many donkeys coming from the adults in the audience when <laughs> they were supposed to <laughs> hee -haw. And that was funny, you know. I think people yeah, just don't get yeah. enough chance. They get t touched back with your childhood. Right. You know, what's the first story you remember as a child? Hmm. My grandmother told me this strange little story called Raggy Lug, which was about a little bunny that was hiding. His mother had told him to be quiet and be still, or the snake would come. And I thought my grandmother made it up, but later I did find it in a book that... Um, do you tell it? No. It, it, it's such a strong warning of, listen to your mother. It's a little too <laughs> bum, bum for me. But, um, <laughs> well, that's probably why she was telling probably it. why she told it to yeah. me. Yeah. But, um, but no, I, I, I remember hearing those stories, you know, that people, maybe I wouldn't go to sleep or something, and I remember right. those right. stories. Oh, that's fun. We're going to have to stop right here, and we're going to leave for just a minute, and then we'll come back, and Jane is going to tell you and me a story yeah. so don't go Irish hero Finn and it's also about his aunt whose name was Turin and it is also about a man named Fergus Finla who was the man who in all Ireland hated dogs more than anyone else when Fergus would see a dog he would throw stones at it until it ran away he only employed servants who hated dogs and if he heard that a man had drowned a litter of puppies he would go to that man and offer to marry his daughter now Finn was just the opposite. Finn loved dogs. He knew everything about dogs, from the smallest milk tooth to the rocking of the long, last yellow one. He knew what was to be expected of a tail, a nose, a paw, and how much a dog could be trained without losing its honorable qualities. Finn loved all 300 of his dogs, but there were two, Bran and Skolan, to whom he gave special affection. And if you were to guess for 20 years, you would not guess why, but by the end of this story, you will know. 
Now time came when Finn and his men, the Fianna, were encamped beside a river, and they were paid a visit by Finn's mother and by her much younger sister, Turin. Oh, Finn's mother, there is nothing to be said for her beauty. And of Turin, well, her voice was like the cuckoo, her face shined like the spring, and her form flowed like the river. And every man who saw her wished that that form would flow to him. But it was to a man of Ulster that she gave her heart, whose name was Eolan. Now, when Eolan came to ask for the Lady Turin's hand in marriage, Finn made a curious stipulation. Either he did not know the men of Ulster well enough, or he knew them all too well. He made Eolan sign a pact that said if there was ever any reason to think the lady unhappy in her marriage, she would be returned to her family. And Eolan signed, and so did one of Finn's men, who much would rather have been marrying the Lady Turin himself. Well, the Lady Turin and her husband went off to his stronghold, and they lived happily for a while. But the law of life is change, and Eolan was a man with a past. He was not exactly ashamed of it. He just thought it was behind him, when in fact it was ready to jump up and block the way to the future. For before he had married, he had been the sweetheart of a woman of fairy, a woman of she, and he had often visited her there and given his lover's whistle to call her. And she would say, oh, there is the pulse of my heart. There is the flower of my tree. And then for a long time, Eolan did not come. And the lady of fairy, whose name was Ukdel, which means fair breast, she was puzzled. When she heard that he had married another, her heart stopped beating, and she became capable of every ill deed. And she began to plot her revenge in bitter collectedness until she came up with a plan. She disguised herself as Finn's female messenger, the best known woman in all Ireland. And she went to the keep of, for, of Eolan, and she said, I have a message from Finn. He will pay you a visit soon. Oh, said Eolan, we will give him an Ulster feast. And now, she said, I have a message for your queen. And she and Turin walked into the garden, and when they were out of sight of the house, Ukdelv took a hazel rod out from under her cape, tapped her, and her form began to whirl and swirl, and Turin turned into a hound. Ukdelv took a chain and roughly clasped it around the dog's neck and began to drag her away, saying, Bad girl, stealer of another girl's sweetheart, what would he think of you now if he saw your skinny legs and your long nose and your tail? He would not love you now, bad girl. And she dragged her down the road and said, have you heard of Fergus Finlaw, the man who in all Ireland is unfriendliest to a dog? And indeed, Turin had heard, and she began to shiver, for Ukdelv did not want a good home for the dog. She wanted the worst home possible. When she came to the castle of Fergus Finlaw, a servant answered the door and said, you can stay out here with the dog, or you can come in without her. I come from Finn, and I come in with the dog, or he will hear of it. Now Finn's name opened all doors, and Fergus came down himself, and he said, It's a dog. Go away and kill her, and when you come back, I will give you a present. I bring this dog from Finn. He bids you keep her until he comes for her. Finn sends me a dog. Finn knows I have no liking of dogs. I have given you the message, Master, and here is the dog. Do you take her or refuse her? I could refuse anything to Finn. It would be a dog, but I can refuse him nothing. Give me the dog. Ukdelv put the leash in his hand, and she went away, mm, very pleased with her revenge. The dog had not stopped shivering, and the next day, Fergus called to his servant. And he said, has the dog stopped shivering yet? For if it shivers off a leg, Finn will not be pleased. It has not, Master. Is there any cure for the shivers? Well, I have heard if you pick her up and hug her and kiss her, hug her and kiss her. It is only what I have heard, Master. Well, I'd do more than that for Finn. So the dog was brought to Fergus, and he said, if you put so much as a start of a tooth against a finger, and he reached down and picked her up, and the dog did not snap. And he hugged the dog to his chest, and he began to walk moodily up and down the hall, giving her one hug. <coughs> for every five paces. And the dog reached up a shy little tongue and gave him a lick on the chin. Do not do that again, he said, now and forever. If it has to be kissed, I'll kiss it. I, I'd do more than that for Finn. And he brought his lips down to the dog's muzzle, and he gave her a kiss. And the dog began to give little wiggles and yips. And when he put her down, there was not a single shiver left. 
the dog would not be separated from him. She followed him everywhere. He said, huh, the dog likes me. And the next day he said, by my hand, I like the dog. And then he became tormented with the idea that someone would throw a stone at her. And he called all of his servants together and he told them that this dog was the flower of his tree, the pulse of his heart, and no one should knock even a single shiver out of her. Now about this time, word came to Finn that his aunt was no longer living with her husband. And he called and sent men for the fulfillment of the contract. Eolan was in a state, for he suspected Uchdelv had stolen his queen. He begged for time to find her, and Finn said, Tell the wife, loser, I will have my aunt, or I will have his head. And Eolan set off for fairy. It was hard to get Uchdelv to see him, but when he did, she said, What do you want, breaker of hearts? He said, Finn will have my head. I know you have taken Turin. Ooh, what if I have? Save me from Finn. Well, she said, if, if I do save your head from Finn, then your head belongs to me. Isn't that right? And he had to agree that was so. And a head, she said, is not much good without the body that goes under it. So your body belongs to me too. Is that right? And he agreed that would be right. If you promise to be my sweetheart from now until the end of time, I will save you from Finn. And Eolan agreed. She went back to the keep of Fergus Finlaw and took the hazel rod and tapped the dog, and Turin's own form came back to her. But in the matter of the two puppies she had given birth to, nothing could be done, and they must stay as dogs. They were given to Finn, and they were Bran and Skolan, and became the best beloved of all his dogs, for they were as smart as men as loyal as dogs, and they were his cousins beside. Turin married the man who had loved her so long, and they lived happily ever after, after he had promised that he had not now, was not now, nor had ever been another sweetheart. Oh, but as for Fergus Finla, he took to his bed for a year and a day, suffering from blighted affection, and he would have died there, too, had not Finn sent him a special pup. And within a week, that pup, pup, was the son of fortune, the flower of his tree, and so he got well too and lived happily ever after. Thank you. Kick flip six stairs takes determination. So will getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. Welcome back. Uh, that was just a wonderful story, oh, Jane. Thank you. I really love it too. It's yeah. Some stories just call out to you. It and has a lot one. in. What What did you like about it most when you heard it the first time? Um, I like the characters. I like Fergus Finla. And, you know, I often wonder, did Turin enjoy being a dog? Did she want to be back to a human? Um, and I like that little, when the pups, oh, nothing could be done. They had to stay as dogs. Interesting, yeah. yeah, yeah. How did you get interested in, because I've heard you tell many Irish stories, mm -hmm. and how did that come about? Uh, how did you get interested in telling the Irish? I, mean, I, I like lots of varieties of stories, but the Irish ones have more character in them. They have a more plot, sometimes too much plot. But you, you get a more of a feeling for the characters. They're not just your stock, you know, the good boy and the bad boy and the good girl. You know, they're, they're interesting and they have some depth to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I just love Finn. Uh, so I uh, always like stories with him in them. Do you think that it, maybe you could tell us in very quickly, 30 seconds, who is Finn? Many people may not know who oh, is Finn. Finn. He's sometimes referred to as Finn McCool, uh, we, but I think he's really Finn, son of Uleo. Uh, he's a great Irish hero, and he seems to morph. I mean, he, if you read the stories, he's lived about four or 500 years. Um, and then there's some more stories of another character named Mongan, who may or may not be Finn, too. So um, he's kind of a superhuman guy. He's incredibly strong and a, and a good warrior. He's not always smart about his love life. And uh, as he got older, he got some of the same foibles as... Um, you know, humans would get. Now, if we don't know the Irish, the Finn, mm -hmm. there is an American folk hero that is sort of adapted from him, mm -hmm. is there not? Which one are you thinking well, of? Well, I'm trying to think what his name is right now. He had a blue cap. Well, oh, there's Paul Bunyan, Paul who is Bunyan, big, yes. but he doesn't really have a lot of character. He's, 
good. We're good. Big dumb guy. Yeah, um, big dumb guy. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't say, but he has some characteristics. And you, it's really the bigness. Well, Finn was the not. There was a, there's a story. There's some kitty stories with Finn as a giant, and I don't think he was supposed to be a giant. I think he was supposed to be just a really big man, not like ten feet tall. Mm -hmm. They were not mm -hmm. a race of giants. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, certainly we got a lot of stories that are, are now American stories and told in America and Appalachia in particular that came over with the settlers from England right. and Ireland. Right. And it's, it's right. wonderful to see that when you can find those little threads and go, oh, I know where that came from. Yeah, Jack, um, particularly. Jack, yeah. Jack. Jack. yeah. Um, and people will say, you know, where is Jack? How can you say that Jack came from England? But Jack and the Beanstalk, I mean, mm -hmm. really, that's... Jack the giant killer. Yeah, you know, the yeah. Jack is just every man. Um, it's, you know, the traditional uh, story storytelling name. You know. Be interesting someday probably for our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, to look back and say who was a character of our time mm -hmm. that is now, you know, being portrayed in stories. Yes, yeah, if that happens, yeah, that would, that would be yeah, interesting. I can't think of anybody right offhand, but maybe our listeners can. Yeah, you know. but I think some of these, I mean, look at Elvis, look at all the stories that spring up about Elvis. You know, he's not really dead, he's living in Las Vegas. He did this, he did that, and that's almost the folk process, you know. It's, exactly. It's, it's close to that. Exactly. Um, because they're in, I had an experience of going to look for a family member, mm -hmm. and he had been dead to me, but when I found him in his home in South Carolina, they had kept him alive, and he was a folk hero hmm. as a football star. Uh, I so remember Gus. that yeah. happens in families, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Do you can you think of anybody in your family that is a folk hero? I can think of some anti heroes. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if they would they would come to the level of folk hero, but there's certainly lots of stories about. And you think, did that man really have that many jobs? How could that have been possible? Right. But he did this and then the other, and he. Um, so yeah, there's some things like that. And that you would class that in the folk process. It's getting there. Yeah, yeah, sort it's of. There. It takes a long time. So that we all need to look at our own family stories and how we tell them, mm -hmm. and realize that we're part of a process. Part of a process. Right. Yeah. So. Jane, thank you so oh, much for really coming. Fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, and thank you for coming. Uh, you know, that uh, if you're not watching, we don't have anything that's to say. The, that's the other part so of storytelling. Exactly. The teller, exactly. the story, and the audience. Yeah. yeah. So please come back. We will have another guest soon, and we'll be here waiting for you on Stories in Focus. Mm -hmm.